What's up, everybody? How many of you have ever played with Lego before? Show of hands, confession. How many of you wish you were playing with Lego right now? Good news, we handed out Lego. Yay! Now, this is one of my childhood favorite toys, Lego, for so many different reasons. One, yes, you could use it to set traps for people late at night. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen Home Alone. It works wonders when you put it on the floor and people walk on it at 2 a.m. unless that person is you. And then it's quite painful. Somebody told me this morning, next to childbirth, Lego on the feet in the middle of the night. That kind of exceeding pain, wonderful. But Lego, what it did for me as a child is it unlocked my imagination in so many different ways. A bunch of different pieces, you put them together, they seemingly look like nothing. I've got my piece today's yellow, it's got four squares, right? It, on its own, it just looks like a yellow blob. But if I were to stick it together or connect it with a whole bunch of other things, incredible stuff can happen. Did you know there are people in our own church who are artists with Lego? One of them sent me a handful of photos that are displayed in his home, his parents' home, and here's what, here's what we got, okay? Check these out. This is what you can do with Lego. The Titanic. You can build it with Lego. Check out this next one. The Millennium Falcon. Star Wars fans, come on. Let's go, right? Or you can just go regular old space stuff, build a spaceship or a Learjet or whatever. Or how about a castle with a dragon and a moat and so many different things. Lego, believe it or not, is quite incredible. But one piece on its own doesn't allow you to achieve any of these masterpieces that are on the screen, courtesy of Evan, our drummer, this morning. These are his Lego creations. Now here's the thing. We've been talking about loving like Jesus, living like Jesus. That's our mission. That's why we exist as a church. And then we started talking last week through Pastor Jamie on how do we, how we do that? If we're going to love like Jesus, if we're going to live like Jesus, how do we actually do that? He talked about learning to give like Jesus, an incredible teaching from God's word to learn to give open-handed, to learn, to learn to be processing the opportunity to give before having received anything, that being the posture of outrageous generosity. And today we're going to continue on that dialogue, talking about Lego, connecting like Jesus, or in other words, authentic community. If you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to look at the second chapter in its entirety. We're going to comb it and mine it. I'm not going to read all of the verses, but it's going to set us up for several things that we can learn to hear together with one another about the power of connection and, more importantly, how do we do that like Jesus would? How do we connect like Jesus? All right, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse number 1 of that chapter. I'm going to read the first 13 verses, then I'll pause, I'll highlight something there, and then we'll look at the next sections of text in order. Here we go, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the, no the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers." They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthenons, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phygeria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, 
And, all, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, ah, they're just drunk, that's all. End of chapter. Well, it's not end of chapter, but end of that section. So what are we gonna learn about community and authentic community in this space? I'll say this. We cannot conjure up God's presence. We can only encounter God's presence. Here's what's super interesting in this scene that we just read about. So we're in Passion Week, right? This week of history in the Jewish culture and calendar where all the the symbolism of the religion came to one crescendo moment. They were celebrating how God had spared their ancestors from destruction in Egypt. This devastating plague that was poured out on the land where the firstborn of everything, human being and animal, was taken by the Lord in a declaration of his power so that Pharaoh would relinquish the slavery and the subjugation that he inflicted on the the people of Israel and let them go. It was a culmination of all these different different things that they experienced as a community up to that point, these plagues, these challenges, these burdens. And it was during this plague that they had specific instructions. If they were to be saved from this calamity, they were to take the blood of a lamb, a firstborn lamb, and paint their doorposts. And as the spirit of the Lord would pass over the doorposts, the blood would turn the spirit into a different direction. It would know that they were saved from that experience right there. And so Jews, every single year, would gather together in Jerusalem in celebration, the Passover feast, right? They're super creative in their name calling, right? The Spirit of the Lord would pass over the homes. We're gonna call it the Passover. Makes sense. Sometimes we need those cues as human beings so we remember certain things. Like if you so happen to have your birth date on your marriage anniversary date, that's a win for you, right? One date that you remember, not two. It can be helpful. And so the Jews were there celebrating in Jerusalem. This is where the scene unfolds and takes place. What we also know is just before this moment, Jesus died. He was put to death on the cross. He was ridiculed, he was mocked, he was made fun of in so many different ways. There were people that believed in Jesus not understanding the fullness of what was happening and transpiring right before them. They were devastated. Most of his friends and the people that walked closely with them couldn't be found because they too were fearing for their lives. If they're gonna do this to Jesus, a rabbi, a learned scholar, an amazing individual, then then what, what would they do to me? And so he faced this moment in his life as the Passover lamb so that each one of us could actually metaphorically and intentionally and spiritually live into this Passover that was a part of the heritage of the nation of Israel. Meaning that if you and I would choose to love Jesus, to follow after Jesus, the blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ is now written on our hearts, on our minds, so that we are spared from the calamity that is to come. We're also invited into the best version of life that exists here, right now, on this side of eternity. This once broken relationship with, between creation and creator was now fully restored through Jesus. Now we know that, but this group of people hadn't yet known that to the fullness. All they knew is the person that they were following was no longer with them. The person that they looked to, the person that they learned from, the person that inspired them to consider that God was even more than they thought had just been brutally murdered. Now the good news was a handful of people went to the place where he was buried and when they arrived, there was no body. 
And so the rumors started, oh my goodness, Jesus is alive and, and eyewitnesses saw this resurrected Jesus. And so this community of believers still th- saw value in gathering together to wait to see what would happen. What would God do next? And in this particular moment known as the day of Pentecost, God decides to do something unprecedented up until this point. He pours out his presence in abundance. Not because this group of people was gathered together saying certain things, singing certain things, doing certain things. They weren't conjuring up his presence. God's presence can't be created. God has always existed. That's what one of the many things that sets God apart from the rest of us as his creation. We were created beings. God's never been created. God always has been and always will be. The uncreated one creating all things. So it's amazing that they're gathered together probably because this is what they would do normally, typically. In some other translations, you kind of get some inference where this group of people were huddled together because they were not only excited, but some of them were quite nervous. They were quite nervous that they might be next. And so some people suggest that they were hiding. They were all together and they were hiding just in case the same people who crucified Jesus found them and wanted to do the same to them. And it's in the midst of this emotionally turbulent space and environment that the presence of God shows up in unprecedented fashion. I say the word unprecedented because up until this point, to be filled with God's presence, God's spirit, was an experience reserved for a select few individuals. Sometimes it was a king, sometimes it was a prophet, sometimes it was a a person that was going to do something incredible because God empowered them to do so. It wasn't poured out in abundance, it wasn't something that everybody could encounter at the same time, but in this moment, it became that reality. Everybody, all at once, right in that moment, encountered God's presence. It's super important for us to understand. We cannot conjure up God's presence. We can only encounter God's presence. Maybe you're here today and you're like, okay, I understand that conceptually. What do you mean by that? The quality of your relationship with another person is dependent on what you do to invest in that relationship. For example, my daughter, Layla, she is amazing. If you've had the opportunity to meet her, she'll probably have hugged you, even if she doesn't know your name. This is her love language. She hugs all things and all beings, regardless of your age, stage, or status in life. And she doesn't always expect something from you, unless that some person is me. Then she expects some money or something from me. Now, my daughter, Layla, we have this great relationship. We're connected. We enjoy spending time with one another. That richness of relationship is dependent on my willingness to engage her. Here's what I mean. She is always ready to hug. Always. She sometimes has to physically remind me, Dad, I haven't had my hug yet today. And me being the non-hugger that I am, go like, oh yes, this means connection, and I have to hug her. Now what's really cool is I'm not conjuring up this, this love that she has for me. This is a gift that God has given her, this natural, innate ability to love. It's tremendous. I don't want to squash it. I don't want to squish it. I don't want to ignore it. I want to celebrate it. And I don't celebrate it unless I recognize it, unless I encounter it, unless I get down on my knees and give her that hug. Now our relationship with God functions similarly, but yet very different. God's love for you is steady. It's constant. 
You know, when you're doing that thing that you don't want to do that you shouldn't be doing, God still loves you. You know, when you are, are uh, missing out on an opportunity, he's asked you to do something and you're like, ah, I'm too nervous, don't make me do it. He still loves you. You know, when you don't know what to do, you don't know how to act, you don't know where to serve or where to give, God still loves you. He's steady, he's steadfast in his loving approach to you. No matter what we do, his character remains the same. But the quality of our relationship with him, the connection, is dependent on us. He waits to connect with us. As we go to him, as we encounter him, richness in our connection grows and flourishes. The author James from the Bible says it like this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This first cluster of followers of Jesus from Galilee, the same Galilee where people said, can anything good come out of Galilee? That type of community of people were the very first ones to experience God's presence poured out in abundance. And because of that day, you and I now benefit from that initial encounter. They encountered the presence of God, the power of God. They were discipling one another. They discipled other people who then encountered God, who then discipled other people, who then encountered God, who then discipled other people and then encountered God. And because of that, you and I have the privilege of encountering the same God. But we have to remember, we don't conjure up any sort of connection. We just encounter it. We invest in it by the way we posture ourselves. That's what connection is all about. How do we connect like Jesus? We recognize where we come from and whose we are. We start there. Knowing that as we move closer to God, we will encounter him personally and practically in so many ways. So next time you're like, man, Lord, I feel far from you. Try getting down on your knees and giving them a hug. And see what he invites you into next. So that's the way this chapter starts, this encounter of God that they didn't manifest, they didn't create. God blesses them with this encounter experience. Here's what happens next if you want to turn back to that text. Verses 14 through 41. That's a lot of verses Don't worry, I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to skim over it. I'm going to give you the highlights, and I really encourage you to invest in studying this this next week. Listen to it on repeat. If you're not a reader, listen to it on repeat. You version, it'll read the Bible to you. It's amazing. Here's what happens. Okay, the Holy Spirit comes, poured out, and all of a sudden, there's this cascading overflow that happens. Because when God's presence moves, there's a cascading formative experience and effect that takes shape. It literally can change the way we live. It can change the way that we think. It can change the way that we live and breathe and move. It does all of those things. And it's this cascading effect that now takes shape. One of the ways that this is experienced is the individuals that were gathered in that space start speaking in languages that they don't know. Languages of other Jews from other parts of the world, which is super important for us to remember. Because Jews from all over the known then world had traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So they're there from Crete and places in Asia and places like modern day Turkey and Syria and all these other places where the primary language is something other than what they were speaking in their Jewish heritage. So they might have been, their first language might have been Greek or Turkish or Yiddish or whatever it might have been. And as this encounter happens with this initial group of people, all of a sudden they're hearing these people that they know are from Galilee speaking in languages that they don't have any business knowing how to speak. The clarity of God's message and hope and gospel and whatever is pouring out of them is being heard in their own plain languages. And they are bewildered. They're mesmerized. 
There's a cascading effect that happens when we encounter God's presence, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of people around us. There's something that spills out and over. It overflows from us into the people around us, into the situations around us. Have you ever been faced with a challenging moment? Maybe it was at work or relationally or socially where somebody is like really aggravated with you and instead of meeting their intensity in anger for whatever reason, you were able to stay calm? That's not a human response. If you come at me in a human response, I'm gonna go back at you. Yeah? Am I the only one that acts like that? I don't know. (laughs) Or are we just like, hmm, I don't want to admit that that's what I do. Right? Somebody comes after us, we oftentimes are like, no, we're going to meet that intensity and then some. Right? It happens in my house. I think we should do this way. No, 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 no. No, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it this way. It's pretty fun to watch it, actually. It's hard when it's contained in the small space of a vehicle, though. You know what I'm saying? There's this cascading effect of God's presence that happens. What this other public group of people was experiencing was something unprecedented. They'd never heard Galileans speaking in other tongues in a way that they could understand. It was confusing. It was mesmerizing. It was bewildering. And yes, some people thought that they were drunk. I have yet to know a drunk person that speaks a conscious other language. (laughs) Slurring your words does not equal another language. And yet these other Jews from other countries around the then known world are hearing the very presence of God spill out of those who have encountered them. When we encounter the presence of God, we don't only change, but the people around us start to notice. There's something different. How are you able to stay calm when that person was just yelling at you? I don't know. How were you able to stay unshaken when everything around you has just turned to ash? I don't know. How were you able to find the shred of hope in the shrapnel of this situation? I don't know. And humanly, that's true. We don't know. But that's the cascading effect of God's presence. That's why why we have to connect like Jesus. We have to connect like Jesus. We have to prioritize that connection with our creator so that in those moments when we're pushed to the brink, where we're frustrated, when we don't know what to do, when we don't know which way to turn, when we have exhausted all of our human efforts and capabilities, whether that's as a parent, a grandparent, a spouse, a single person, a child, when you've reached your wit's end and you don't know what else to do, those are the moments. Those are the moments that reveal whether or not we've encountered a living God. Whether or not we have been changed by his presence. Because it's in those moments of desperation that we can find a way forward despite all of the chaos and the odds and the challenges that are stacked against us. And what I love about this section of text from 14 onwards is one bold individual, a guy named Peter, steps forward and says, hey, yo, we're not drunk. You can actually clearly understand what we're saying. This is because we've encountered God. And then he speaks prophetically towards the community, a sense of encouragement, and he calls them back to this section of text 
from what we refer to as the Old Testament, the book of Joel. Joel, And it says, in the last days, your daughters and your sons will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will have visions. This is going to be the evidence of God moving in and through you in incredible ways. And what he's saying is like, that day is here. That day is now. This is that moment we've been waiting for. In the same way, we can do the same thing when we encounter God's presence and that cascading effect of his presence overflows from our lives into the lives around us. We get to say with all the confidence in the world, it's not because of me, it is because of Jesus. It's incredible to me when women and men of all ages and stages of life recognize whose they are. When your identity is secure, when your connection is real, you can stand against all sorts of challenges and not lose hope. So 14 through 41, Peter gets up and he's encouraging the gathered public community now and saying, no, no, we're not crazy, we're not drunk. This is a fulfillment of everything that God intended. We're witnessing miracles and history unfolding right before us. Now this happens sometimes in the life of a church in different ways. Like when people choose to get baptized and they share their stories of hope whether that's they've relinquished addiction or they've overcome a struggle or whether at a young, tender age they just chose Jesus. All of that is amazing. You hear that story and you're like, my goodness, that's the cascading effect of God's presence. Something inside you stirs, reminding you that you are not only human, but that you matter and that God can and will do it again. Can we trust that he will? Some of you are in this room because people have prayed for you. By name. Isn't that amazing? That's the cascading effect of God's presence. And now we have the privilege, the responsibility, and the opportunity to do the same thing. On a personal level, encountering with God, connecting with him, truly connecting. And allowing him to build the pieces around us into something incredible through the cascading effect of his presence. So this is the whole scene that unfolds from verses 1 through 41. And then in, chapter, in the last few verses in this chapter, 42 through 47, which are probably some of the most quoted verses in all of Scripture, we get this picture of what's being formed in terms of a community, authentic community, as a result of these two things. Here's what they say, starting in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Now, the first 41 verses is like this one simultaneous scene unfolding, like instantly. And then we hit verse 42, and we back up. We back up the camera lens from 50,000 feet away, and we're seeing what happens over time as this encounter and cascading effect create and generate some connection in the community. What's really interesting to me about this is it speaks a lot about community formation, meaning that the people around you matter. And I wonder if they didn't just matter because out of necessity, like none of us enjoy feeling lonely. We want to feel connected to some people, and so that matters. But there was more than that. There was a a cause or a mission or a purpose where you needed people around you. 
Many of the vocations of the day were not a single proprietor type of vocation. A fishing business required people to to be fishing out in the waters in the boats, then bringing the fish into another group of people that would clean the fish, and then giving that group of people the fish, and then they would dry the fish, and that another group of people would take the dried fish and then take it to market and sell the fish. It was a holistic enterprise where all these moving parts had to function together. Even military strategists understood the value of community, a unit working together. I'm going to ask for five individuals to help me illustrate this here today. So pop up on stage right now. I know names. Yes. Okay. Okay. I got one. I need four more. Two. Perfect. Two, three, four. I just need one more. Right on. Okay, perfect. Okay, these are incredible shields made by Andre Vandel. Come on, look at that. Super fun. These are a, can, you, can we hold this? Perfect, look, you can hide behind it. They don't even see you now. Yay! These are an artistic representation of what a Roman shield would look like. Now, why a Roman shield? Well, it just so happened that when this was all taking place, in this young fledgling community, this group of people that were loving like Jesus and living like Jesus or attempting to, they lived under the Roman occupation. And that meant Roman soldiers were everywhere. Maybe some of them had even been subjected to the abuses that happened through the Roman soldiers. Maybe they were beaten, they lost a loved one, etc. So they would have been familiar with a Roman shield, what it was used for. It was used to fend off things, deflect projectiles, also to knock things down. They were big, they were massive. What's really interesting is when you had a group of people all connected together, can I get one of you guys to go right here? You would have what was called a shield wall. A shield wall was said to be almost impenetrable. If the shield wall was connected with one another, if the community formed together, actually functioned like it was supposed to, nothing would get through. Nothing from the enemy would withstand the shield wall. And those behind the wall were protected. Now, as military strategy goes, there's onslaught that comes from ahead of you. There's onslaught that comes from your sides, and there's onslaught that comes from above and behind. And so what's really cool in a human, in a human squadron of Roman soldiers is you would have individuals lined up in a big square, and then you'd have some people also responsible for covering the top projectiles of the arrows raining down on you. So we're going to have Brendan and Carl. You're going to grab each one of these, and I'll help position you, and this will be kind of fun. All right, zip in here behind, boys. If I can have one of you right about here. And Adam, you might want to duck your head ever so slightly. You go right there. And then Brendan, you're going to come right here in between Adam and Janik. Okay. Now, this is a small little representation. And it's not perfect, but you're getting the point, yes? So on all sides, you had somebody watching your back, so to speak. In front, on top, behind, to the sides. When a squadron set themselves up in this kind of formation, it did not matter what was raining down on them. They could stand firm. But I think we should put that to the test. So let's have a little bit of fun. Now, to shoot? Sure. Now, here's the thing about community formation. You can read those verses in the New Testament, and they can seem like amazing. Yeah, we all want that kind of community. But when we start to build that type of connection like Jesus, we never know if it's going to be able to withstand a bullet. And as the bullets start flying and looking for little crevices... We're wondering if it's gonna, the next shot that we take is going to be the one that actually takes us out. 
And sometimes, one of these, getting them one-on-one, it's fine. But sometimes, life isn't like that. It feels like they're coming at us all at once. Oh, man. And it's chaotic. There's one other thing I want you to see in the shield wall. There are gaps. And the gaps are for what? So that you can see what's coming. Now, not everybody can see what's coming. So if you were like Adam, who's right behind here, that if I body check this, I'd push him over. He's not seeing anything. So he's got to rely on what Brendan and what Carl can see because they can see down their shield out to what's ahead. Has the onslaught stopped? They might be able to say yes. Or they might be saying, no, buckle up, it's just started. This is the power of community. Authentic community. People who stand beside you people who have encountered God and now walk with you. And here's the cool thing. People who have yet to encounter God can still be in your community because the cascading effect of God's presence in your life may inspire them to see something differently or for the very first time and might literally transform their life right before you. Friends, this is why we talk about community. It's not just a fun buzzword that sounds good. It is essential for you to be able to experience life the way God intended. You need your own shield wall. People who are willing to be present with you in all of life's moments. Can we give them a hand? Now here's the other reality. The other reality is, if we're honest, very few of us have this type of community around us. For whatever reason, we've been afraid to create it, or we once had it, and now those people who stood with us are no longer here. Like maybe they've graduated on into glory, into heaven, maybe they're with Jesus. Or maybe they've just left us. They've moved somewhere. They've, they've gone to another church. They've abandoned their faith or their friendships or whatever. And now we're like sitting, instead of a, a shield wall, we've got a shield lump. It's just one of us. Friends, I want to encourage you, regardless of where you are today, whether you think that your shield wall community is intact or whether you are looking for that kind of shield wall community, it begins with encountering God's presence. And as you encounter God's presence, he will bring those people around you, and it may be some people that surprise you. It may mean that you have to take a little bit of a risk and and put yourself out there and actually share your name with somebody. It may mean that you actually have to take us up on the many, 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 many invitations that we give to be involved in some sort of discipleship type community. And that's what I'm highlighting here today. All of our discipleship communities. There are various sizes, stages, flavors, but all of them are designed to help us love and live more like Jesus. As we study scripture, as we see what we can learn from it, as we try to apply it to our lives and as we pray for one another. There's really simple expressions, but it does take some effort. It doesn't just happen organically. We have to respond to whatever invitations God is putting before us. So if you don't have that community or if there is space in your pre-existing community for new people, this is for you. We need to know who you are 
because we have a whole spectrum of communities and groups that are ready to receive people so that you can learn to grow in your love and your live like Jesus, meaning the verbs of both those things. And all you need to do is put your hand up and let us know your name and how we can connect you with the right type of community so that you too don't have to flounder and try to figure it out all on your own. That you will have a group of people around you that help you encounter the presence of God. And in that encounter, watch not only your own life change, but the circumstances, the situations, and even the individuals around you change over time because of God's power, not yours. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for the powerful image of what community formed on you can look like. And Holy Spirit, I just pray the people that you've been reminding, encouraging, inspiring to prioritize this type of connection, even in the busyness of life, God, I just pray that we'd respond. Lord, that we would be willing to be known so that we can make you known to those around us. Would you bless us and protect us? Would you make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us? Would you grant us your favor and your peace in Jesus' name? Amen.